Hi, my guests today are Robert Murch, who is, I believe, chairman of the board for the Talking Board Historical Society, based in Colorado, and John Kozik from the Salem Witch Board Museum, both of which sound like excellent titles to bestow upon yourselves. <laughs> I've never done a podcast with two guests, so let's see how this goes. You two probably know each other well enough not to talk over each other <laughs> like me and my friends do. To get a, a little a little background, being custodians, as it were, of the entire history of the talking board, Ouija board, we are board, whatever you wish to call it, is a peculiar thing to fall into. So I guess one at a time, starting with Robert, who I will refer to as Merch throughout this, how did you fall into it? Or were you dragged? Well, first, thanks so much for having us. Uh, we love doing this stuff. And John and I could talk about the Ouija board uh, for hours. And and John actually does that every day at the Salem Witch Board Museum. So I'm sure he's he's done it today. And now he's going to come here and do it, too. That's quite but, a commitment. <laughs> it's amazing. Um, but, it, you know, for me, it really started because um, I was raised as an Orthodox Jew. And I, I don't look like that today. I'm not a practicing Orthodox Jew. Um, but when you're raised in Orthodoxy, you know, it's all, it's not scary. It's just real. So ghosts, the devil, God, demons, angels, it's just baked into your experience because everyone's told you it's real. And, you know, you're little and you believe everything. So it was never scary. Uh, my grandmother used to like sneak me all the stuff my mom didn't want. So my parents got divorced when I was real little. We moved in with my grandparents and my mother would say, don't let him watch Creature Double Feature. And <laughs> my grandmother would say, absolutely not. And as soon as she'd leave, my grandmother would be like, Creature Double Feature, let's go. So she actually snuck me into a movie, uh, 1986, 1987 called Witchboard. And she literally snuck me in. She could have just, I know it's a rated R movie and I was 13 years old. She could have just, you know, got me in, but she snuck me in. And that movie made an enormous impact on me because it was the first time I saw how the Ouija board was seen by other people. You know, the, the audience right. was genuinely scared of this cardboard and plastic. And as a kid who grew up in like devil God stuff, I was just amazed that th this thing had power that I had never seen anything other than a person really have. And, um, you know, kind of fast forward to going to college, um, 1992, 1993. How old are you in 1987? Sorry. In 1997. I'm, I'm 48 now. Okay, God, so I don't know. Uh, I can't do that kind of math. In my 25 life. years ago, 23. Okay. Let's go with that. Oh, yeah, Ugh, yeah, 23. So at 23, I, I'm in college. This is back like 1992, um, going into um, college. And what happened was I was in a quad. And, you know, that's like uh, three roommates. And yeah. they desperately wanted to go into a fraternity. <laughs> and uh, I knew that if I did that, it was the end of my college career. Bad idea for me. So, um, but I figured if they they did it and they could have parties and I could go visit and then I could study. So that was cool. But part of their rushing for a fraternity was a treasure hunt. And that meant, and one of the listing things was find an old Ouija board. And, and John will tell you the same thing as a New Englander. You are just, it's baked into you that on the weekends, you yard sale, you antique, you flea market, you just, it's the stuff you do. Sundays are usually that day. And, and I knew coming from Boston area that I'd seen a ton. So I, I went home one weekend, not far, you know, University of New Hampshire to where I was living and picked up a bunch. And when they were done, they returned them all. And I hadn't really looked at them. And every single board was different. And I thought, isn't there only one Ouija board? How is this happening? So I, I went to, you know, a library that um, some of your listeners will remember buildings with books in them yeah. <laughs> instead of going online. <laughs> Those of us old enough. <laughs> exactly. And uh, whenever I looked in Britannica or Funkin' Wagnalls, it didn't matter. It said the Ouija board came from somewhere else. None of the, my sources agreed. And that was just, it blew my mind. Wait a minute everyone's played the Ouija board or everyone has a story about it. Everyone's got a feeling about it. I've never heard someone say they don't know what it is. They've never heard of it. And yet we don't know where it comes from. 
and, and that question just set me off into a lifetime journey of really going, hmm, okay, I, I need to pull this apart. And so for me, the hook was, you know, not just the supernatural side, but the history. Who were these people? Who was behind this? What were they thinking? Why did they do this? And then I realized an entire life of the Ouija board was missing. And, and that's what I've kind of tried. Now, you can't pull apart <laughs> the, the facts from what everyone believes. And so it's just, it put me in this kind of lifetime thing to, to answer those questions and have fun along the way. I, I've met so many friends, uh, you know, John is my best friend. And it's so cool to share a hobby with someone who has the same passion. And we're not the only ones, by the way. Lots of other people at the Talking Board Historical Society, we all represent kind of a different view of the Ouija board. But th that's how I got started. And it just, it led me to meet other collectors, reach out. Uh, when I first started, it, it was the old guard of collectors who just don't, it's like, it's mine. I'm not going to share that with you. Just yeah. mine. And that was hard when, you, when you're trying to solve things that only the label on the board that they have answers or the planchette or they have papers or whatever. And so I just, you know, tried really hard to knock down those doors and, um, before you knew it, younger people were starting to collect and they like to show things, you know, Instagram, Facebook, social media is wonderful. And that really changed the game because it, it, even though we're all collectors and we compete, we're not competing against each other. You know, we know who wants what, and if we find it, it's like, oh, here you go, you know, yours. So we've kind of made a nice community um, where we can not, you know, be, be so like, you know, me, mine, yeah. crash, you know, <laughs> Led Zepp bootleg oh collectors. God. Yes, exactly. So that that's my story. Okay, John, is yours kind of the same? Totally different. <laughs> uh, totally different. Uh, totally different. I think. Um, so yeah, again, thank you for having us. I love talking about the Ouija board. So Merch mentioned me being at the museum earlier, and I don't get sick of it at all. So the way I became interested in it was I inherited my grandmother's board in the late nineties. Oh, and. Um, I had remembered her using it when I was a kid. She would use it alone and she was very fast on it. She would fly on the, uh, on the board of the planchette and um, yell out letters and numbers quicker than people could write them down. And so, uh, you know, she would use it in a room by herself or, you know, other people around while she used it. And I, I wasn't allowed in that room. So I had spied on her through the window or through her down the top <laughs> stair. And so at some point later, I knew that she believed that board was evil and had lied to her. And so she had put it in a black trash bag under the couch. And so I remember playing hide and seek with my sister and being next to the Ouija board and getting that pointed out to me. And I didn't know exactly what it meant other than that's probably not a safe place to be was next to the Ouija board. Um, but in the late nineties, you know, she passed away and I inherited the board. It actually took three years to convince my family to give me the board. They thought I would open a portal <laughs> with it. So is your background similarly religious no no religion okay. whatsoever zero zero religion but you know so going online to learn more about that board i was blown away fascinated that you know again like merch i thought the ouija board only looked one way and so now i'm seeing hundreds if not thousands of different boards uh that had been sold and so i've always been a very obsessed collector i've collected since i was a little kid Everything from, you know, monster toys all the way to vintage Halloween, Kentucky Fried Chicken, a lot of different things. And so I started collecting Ouija boards. About six years into collecting, I finally met a friend, a mutual friend named Calvin, and then eventually Merch. And, um, you know, we all share that same passion. We all have very different backgrounds, but we all have a same love for the Ouija board. But that's where it starts. And then, you know, we all... the us with some other people, uh, we formed a group called the Talking Board Historical Society. So we're a registered nonprofit. We research, preserve, celebrate the history of these boards. Uh, and through, you know, Merch's research, we've really uncovered some pretty major things, you know, women being responsible for naming it and proving work at the patent office. You know, we've been able to put headstones in for those like her who was, were buried in unmarked graves. Three years ago, I opened the museum. It's the world's only Ouija board museum. And about six months ago, I was in the UK. I lectured about the Ouija board at Sage Paracon. And when I came back from that lecture, I left my job of 22 years just to talk about the Ouija board at the museum all day. So that's, that's got to be a good place from. to be. 
It is. It was, it's, uh, I love it. I mean, you know, you always hear the cliches of like, you know, you'll never work a day in your life, but you're doing something you love. And I don't feel as though it's work. You know, I go there and I hang out and people come in and, you know, I've weeded out a lot of things because people have to kind of seek me out the way the, the museum is. It's in the back of another store, a uh, Harry Potter store, coincidentally. Um, and so you have to kind of know where you're going. It's like a speakeasy kind of. And then they pay an admission to come back. So, you know, I don't most people are excited to be in Salem. They're on vacation. And yeah. so to see something about the Ouija board where they just question, wait, there's actually history behind the alphabet on a board. Uh, so I get people that are in great moods, great spirits and um, want to learn about it. So it's a, it's a win-win for me because, you know, I get to talk and share about my passion for these boards to an audience of people that have, you know, set aside time and money to, to come seek it out. Cool. I mean, just let me just give you a, a very short version of my introduction to the to the board, which time has messed with my memory as it does with us all. I w I'm going to say around the time which board came out, I remember the movie. It, it, I think it was that generation's Exorcist. Oh, maybe maybe not quite such a good movie, but still, it, it brought the board into our. Uh, arena and mm. i am i am welsh wales has a huge history of of witches witchcraft and i fell very easily down and asked the crowley hole quite quite young which was great because there's nothing better than scary things to impress your friends or girls mm. and that was about as outlandish as, as it could get but you could not i had never seen a board um, you couldn't buy them over here. You could you couldn't even buy Twinkies over here. We didn't have a <laughs> McDonald's. That that's kind of how it was. So, using what I knew of the board, I I made my own. Now we had a top loading VHS player that used to slide out on a shelf from its unit. I put the VHS on top of the TV. I pulled the shelf out of the unit, and I simply drew letters on it with a marker and used a glass. And it took me, well, okay, so we're getting to the next stage here. Working it by myself, it would not work. I just could not get it to do things with me. And as soon as I introduced somebody else into the equation, we were away. Uh, and as I'll sort of explain as we go along, sometimes at quite frightening speeds. So I presume you both you're both obviously practitioners. What what are your earliest recollections of of using it and, and how how useful was the information or or maybe um legible was the information that it gave you in those early days? Well, you know, I can tell what a funny thing you said Welch. So like I'm Welsh, oh, yeah. Merch, is, Merch is a Welsh name. Most people think it's German, but uh, so I totally feel you. And to go along with the uh, Alistair Crowley thing, I think John was there too. Um, I got to play the Ouija board in a room where Alistair Crowley supposedly did stuff at War Castle. So it was super cool. But anyway, That always just, adds it, a nice dimension, doesn't it? Yeah, it definitely scared the hell out of everyone because when this yeah. stuff was happening it made people feel like, Oh, something's really happening. It's at the stage, you know? And, and I, so you, you said, um, practitioners. Um, I, I don't know if I consider myself a practitioner more than I, I play it a lot, but I play it because I go to conventions and speak about it and, and people want to play with the Ouija guy, right? Like they're okay. If it's going to work, it's going to work with you. And I've never had a problem having it work. Um, but I've never had an experience that's made me think or change my view on being skeptical, but very open minded. Mm -hmm. You know, I've had other experiences which which would have definitely shaken my views on things. But the Ouija board has never. It's just given me enough to want to play again and, and to look more. It, it's different with whoever you're playing. Right. So, yeah, yeah, that's the experience. Like you said, you it worked better when you brought someone in. And yeah, it definitely does. And, and it changes what happens, whether that's idiomotor response or people believe telepathy or 
whether they parted the veil and talked to, you know, their grandmother, whatever, whatever it is, they're bringing something to the board. And, and the Ouija board is like a big mirror. It just reflects what you've brought to it. And so my experiences have never been bad, but I have also been careful to never ask questions I don't want to hear, right? Okay. Like the, most people, they stop using the Ouija board because it tells them something that scares them. I mean, I, I always tell people, ask for the lottery numbers. If you're going to do this, like, let's, <laughs> let's, be a, let's be a millionaire, you know, um, and don't ask why you, you know, how you're going to die. That's just going to scare you for the rest of your yeah, life. Yeah. And for me, I, I actually don't use the Ouija board, obviously not because I'm afraid of it or anything like that, but it works so well for my grandmother that um, I'm afraid it won't work the same way for me. I mean, I've tried and it has not worked the same way. I've been a musician for over 35 years and, you know, the best analogy or comparison I can say is, you know, if Jimi Hendrix was my father, I wouldn't want to play guitar. And so that's really how I feel about the Ouija board is I believe they work. They work differently for everybody. And, uh, you know, you influence that board quite a bit. And I am afraid that I want it to work for me so badly that I will influence it into not working for me. Okay. So do you two have very <laughs> opposing views on what it is i mean merch you still refer to it as uh, as a game and playing it mm -hmm. but but you john still treat it with a kind of reverence of hmm maybe i shouldn't go down this road perhaps do you differ uh, in that way i don't think so i i think you know we say play just because uh it is considered a game and using it you know uh, playing it but um I don't think we differ too far as far as like believing how it works for people, you know, uh, working differently for everybody, people influencing it quite a bit. And really, to me, I like to say like, no one's wrong. It just works differently, you know? So you have a belief of say, you shouldn't use it alone. Uh, and then you try to use it alone anyways, <laughs> more than likely yeah. uh, it'll, you know, uh, the experience will be influenced by that you know, making your own boards and putting your energy into it. People believe that it might work better than a store-bought board. And I don't necessarily believe that, but, you know, if you believe the board would work better for you because you made it, it just might. I made so, it out of necessity, to be fair. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I just wanted in. <laughs> and when I, when I got in, I didn't... I, I'll say I wasn't ready for what for what I got back. But I'll also say I probably treated it with not disrespect. That's the wrong word. Irreverence, perhaps. A kind of like when you first steal a bottle of whiskey off your folks and you've seen them drink it and you drink it all and <laughs> you get bitten on the ass, yeah? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's kind of where I'd put it. Uh, how far back does your oldest board go and... Uh, do you go right back to the 1800s with what you've got there? I mean, at the museum, there's a board from 1890, and it's really the board that would later become Ouija. So that's the oldest, you know, mass produced board or, you know, uh, there are homemade boards older than that. Uh, they're much harder to date, you know, what they are. I yeah. believe the oldest one that we ha that we've ever come across was around 1889 or so, Merch. Does that sound correct mm. to you? Yes. Yep. Yeah. So, I mean, typically, because that evolution of how they're they're coming about with alphabet boards, you know, counting knocks and, you know, pointing to the alphabet and, you know, people using the automatic writing planchette, that, that evolution of the conversation took, you know, a good close to 40 years before we kind of get what we think of today with the alphabet board matched with a pointing device. But we do have 1890, which would soon afterwards become Ouija. Okay, how many, how many, how many boards are you talking in your museum? 100, 50, 500? Uh, in the museum, there's probably just over 100 on display. Between my collection and Merch's collection, we have probably well over 1,000 different boards that could be displayed. So we do rotate things through. Merch is a, a curator. At the museum so between the two collections we rotate a lot of things through that tell different stories you know it's not just for me i want to know i want to be able to tell stories behind the boards not just you know hey look at this really cool rare board it's yeah. not really about the rarity of them it's unless that really is an important 
part of the story as to why it's rare. So yeah, there's over a thousand thousand boards that we can put through, but really the other items are interesting items like the pocket watch that William Fold was wearing when he died, when he fell off the, the roof of the factory. Helen Peters, the woman who named the board, we have her christening dress. We have original hand-drawn sketches that her husband did of her in 1891. So there's a lot besides the boards in the museum. There's, you know, a lot of ephemera. There's a lot of music. There's a lot of literature, all in movies and television thing items and original props, really all telling the story of just how popular this board is and what where it influences people, you know? So it's not just the boards. Okay. I, th I think I read this right, Merch, that if I was involved in a movie production, I can, I can hire rent a board from you <laughs> according to my needs. It's true. <laughs> you, <laughs> I, I have rented uh, boards for different movies, and I also work on different movies and TV shows. I've been incredibly lucky. The Ouija board has been definitely the luck board for me because – you know, I've had a chance to work with Blumhouse and Universal and Warner Brothers. And I mean, it's in Fox and it, it it's cool because it's neat when people actually want to do it right. Like they'll say, uh, hey, this is our scene. And do you want to make it time accurate? Do you want to board from that time? Do you want to act the way they would have acted then? Not the way we act now when we see a Ouija board. So, yeah, besides renting boards, uh, which I did, they, I actually I rented 50 boards to the set of What Lies Beneath in 1999 uh, with Michelle Pfeiffer and Harrison Ford. Yep. At one point, the the uh, main character, her Claire's best friend, was supposed to be a Ouija board collector, and her whole office had the Ouija board. So somewhere, I do have a photograph, a few photographs of how they had done it. But then everything changed. Uh, the Sixth Sense came out, and they decided they didn't want to go the way of was someone dead the whole time and didn't know. So they changed the whole script. So they paid me for it. They never used that. Uh, but I did get to help with that scene. That's the Ouija scene that's in there. So yeah, I get to do all kinds of crazy, cool things. I think out of all the occult items, it's been, it's probably up there at the top, way beyond tarot cards, which, which don't have the same kind of scare appeal at all. Although, there's probably a movie out there to prove me wrong that I haven't seen. I mean, there are literally thousands of tarot decks with, with an indistinct heritage, so far as I know. But the Ouija has, has kind of locked itself into this generation, and I, I kind of like that. I'm, I'm fascinated that most, from what I can gather, most of the boards you have are mass-produced. Exactly. Um, because as far as I know, that it was trademarked, and it's with Mattel at the moment, correct? Hasbro. Hasbro. Um, okay. Yeah. Ouija or Ouija is a trademark that's been in continuous use since 1890. Ah, but so they can use the board without calling it that. Exactly. There was a patent on talking boards and uh, Elijah Bond, one of the co-introducers of the Ouija board um, in Baltimore, Maryland in 1890, they applied for uh, a patent and also a trademark. So it's a brand, you know, think Kleenex instead of tissue or Xerox instead okay. of copy. Because it's been around so long, most people call them all Ouija boards. You know, it's just yeah. a common thing. But people, it, one of the coolest things in John's museum, and, and it's funny for me because I'm looking at this differently, but when he put them up all over the walls, you could see how many infringements there really were. Like I know them, but when you see them all together, like companies that were using the Ouija name that weren't supposed to, you know, and then they, to just get a letter of cease and desist and whatever they stop, don't stop. Um, so you can see them and it happens around the hotspots, 20s, 40s, 60s. But, you know, today anyone can in the U.S. can make a talking board. That patent has expired. But there's a, a there's a cool story um, behind how the Ouija board got its name. John started that and um, how it got patented. So, I mean, oh. that's part of the story. So, John, if you want to tell him. Yeah, sure. Hey, yeah. So when Ken... <laughs> When they put out the first board, Kenner did in 1890, they were just calling it a witch board originally. And not too long afterwards, a woman named Helen Peters at a seance with Elijah Bond and Kenner used the board and asked it what it wanted to be called. And the board actually spelled back Ouija. And then she asked, well, what does that mean? And the board spelled back good luck. 
So the board named itself and Ouija became that first mass manufactured board. And um, really that story uh, was uncovered by Merch. Uh, he spent about six years <laughs> going through flipping pages one at a time, going through newspapers to uncover who this mystery woman was that people had claimed was at, uh, at a seance that had uh, named the board. So fairly new information in the sense that, uh, you know, she's written out of history for over 100 years. And anything you probably read in print is, pro you know, 10 years or older is probably not going to mention, you won't, you know, be different than what it what really happened. Fascinating. So, so what were you do? Just scouring local newspapers in the library <laughs> for interviews with her, or well, what what it is is a lot of things are not uh, indexed or scanned even today. It's just it's a money thing, right? So, yeah. Um, the Ouija board was born in Baltimore, Maryland, and the Baltimore Sun is the main newspaper. There was, there's a few other ones, but it's, it's survived today. And I've worked with them for many, many years. So they let me into their, um, their library. And um, I, I worked with a gentleman named Paul McArdle. I, I will never forget his name because we spend so much time together. And the problem was the evening sun wasn't digitized and was not indexed. So I just had to pick some years and I knew 1920s, there's a lot of uh, lawsuits. And those, the lawsuits, if I get my hands on the actual cases, that's where the real story is, because it, it's in their words, you know, their people who are testifying and witnesses and all that stuff. So I'm, I'm just looking for anything, but you have to read the entire paper because at any point it could, a story could be there, right? It could be a story. It could be an interview. It could be what it ended up being a letter to the editor and uh, Charles Kennard who had left the company two years after it started and had been kind of battling with that company. And he, he wanted everyone to remember that he claimed to invent the Ouija board. He was the author of the Ouija board. He was the originator of the Ouija board. He used any word he could. Um, he had come out with a new board called the Weird A. And he wanted to drum up business. And because there was so much drama going on on the official Ouija board, he just knew very smartly to tag on to that. The Ouija is in the newspaper all the time in 1919 to 1922. So he asked, <laughs> wrote a letter to the editor and said, where, you know, who invented the Ouija board and um, where is it manufactured now? They answered and they answered in a way he didn't like which gave him the opportunity to tell his story. So he writes in that the answer is incorrect. And after 30 years, he is going to tell you what really happened the night Ouija named itself and how Ouija became Ouija. So he tells his story in his words, giant, giant like letter, does another interview with another paper. At the end, of course, it's all about his new board called the Weird A. So he talks about how he, he, he invented Ouija and that Basically, he's got a new board, and it's even better. That's the, the, his point. It's all business. Is, is what he the does. board actually different, notably different in any way? Today, I mean, there's, uh, yeah. a, there's a limit on what, how much better you can make it, surely. Well, what he had come up with is that he believed that the design could be better. In other words, like it, the design today, most people, the planchette will fall off the board as it tries to turn around and, and point down. Mm -hmm. So he was designing things that basically stayed in the middle. So, you know, a lot of his boards were almost like try the letters would be almost like a triangle, like a diamond shape, which would allow a pointer if it had points at both sides to go up and down and side by side. So you almost never fell off the board. So his idea was making it easier, better, faster. Obviously, being not having the name Ouija was the killer. Like you've never heard of any of these boards, the Weird A, because it wasn't Ouija. It, it didn't matter. But what happened in these letters were he thought everyone was dead from that time. It turns out everyone was still alive. So all <laughs> the originators, it's like a Facebook post, right? He wrote his drama and then everyone else was like, oh, hell no, that's not how it happened. So each person writes in about their version of what happened. And the only thing they all really agreed on was the Helen part, that, that she was considered a strong medium. She was Elijah Bond's sister-in-law. She was there. She held the seance. She also went to the patent office and had to prove the Ouija board worked to the patent office in order to get the patent. So what I found was, OK, who's this woman? They're, they're saying Miss Peters, that it's, you know, his his sister-in-law. Well, he had like five sister-in-laws. 
So like I had to, you know, break down, okay, who died when, who, what was happening? Okay. There's only one person left. And then I was lucky enough to be able to hunt down um, Helen Peters adopted a daughter and who had a son and, and that son is still alive and well in Ohio. And he, I got to interview him. And what was wonderful was everything I found out from these letters, from the National Archives, from the Library of Congress, from the patent files, he told me his grandmother told him. So he has no other, and he's never heard about the Ouija board from anyone else other than his grandmother. And his grandmother, Helen Peters, told him exactly the stories that we're telling you today. And it's the weirdest thing because most time family stories don't necessarily equate to the truth. It's like memories, like a game of telephone. By the time yeah, it gets yeah. to you, the story is huge. In this case, it was 100% right. And that blew my mind. I did not tell him anything till I was done with the interview. And to hear that his grandmother told him these things and that all this work that we've been doing and that we uncovered was true according to her. And so, you know, th that's the real cool part. You get to know, you know, I know descendants of all the players that are involved and I stay in touch with them and they're, they're like family to me because, you know, to them, they didn't know their family's involvement. It's just been lost or they didn't care because they lived it, you know, and, but when it all comes out and they find out, you know, we celebrated uh, the 125th anniversary of the naming of the Ouija board in Baltimore and the mayor wrote a proclamation and it was a lot of fun. And these descendants of these people all came to this and all together got to learn all at once what their history was, how they were involved, what their person did. And it's a really cool thing to be talking about a bunch of people and looking out at the audience going, Oh, I'm talking about your grandfather, your great grandfather, <laughs> this person. Yeah, yeah. It's, so, um, but that's how you, you know, that's how you do it. You just gotta, you gotta beat the, you, you look on the internet, it helps you. And then the real thing is, you know, getting in a car and, and driving somewhere. Life sure was slow before the internet. <laughs> yeah, very slow. <laughs> Have you made a movie about this? <laughs> no. Uh, I, we have, we would love to make a documentary and, did, um, yeah, I mean, did I say that you were thinking about or pushing for a documentary? Yeah, very hard. Um, there's a lot to tell on the Ouija board and, you know, we're just scratching the surface. Um, there's some really cool, scary stories. There's really cool history, surprising events that have happened. And, you know, you, you noticed, you said something kind of interesting to me, um, earlier that, you know, the Ouija board's kind of locked into this generation and. As a historian, what I see is every generation adopts the Ouija board and makes it their own. Every decade, you will see something slightly different added to it, a new Ouija station, a new superstition, a new urban legend, whatever. Every generation takes it and makes it their own. And they discover it like it's they've discovered it, like it hasn't really been around because it's somewhat quiet and people don't talk about it. So they feel like, ooh, I got this scary thing. And it's what's awesome. You know, these, these Ouija stations, these board rules that we have, they have nothing to do with how the Ouija board was originally used. But because people have experienced things, it, it's like the Exorcist movie. They never say, use a Ouija board alone and you will be possessed by a demon. They just let it happen. And it's a very brief scene. It's under two minutes. But that that's kind of like the straw that breaks the camel's back. And suddenly Ouija boards that have been seen as jokes, date games, uh, fun things in movies, music, everything. It, we're seeing it get darker in, in all of these things. And that's really the straw that breaks the camel's back. At, at that point, that's been unleashed, the whole demon yeah, thing. Um, the, the, the camel's back never recovered from that, did it? <laughs> well, it's kind of interesting. It's it's recovering now. Um, you think? The, yeah, out here, you know, maybe not in the UK, um, but in the United States, the Ouija board has never been popular, more popular than right now. It's in so many TV shows. It's in so much music. It's everywhere. And it's less, I, I think, I don't think people are as terrified of stuff as they want to experience it. You, you know, in other words, like, you see the exorcist and they're, you know, this kid or a younger person will say, wait, I want to see my best friend's head spin around and spit up split pea soup. It's, it's different. You know what I mean? Like, I, I don't think it's, it's enough. To, it's not enough to scare them away. It's enough to scare them, to make them want to do it. And, and with all these paranormal shows, it used to be that I, I couldn't even go on these and use a Ouija board. That was like forbidden. And now 
I get to pop up on these shows all the time because people use the Ouija board. So I, I don't think, you know, again, I'm not saying people aren't afraid of it, but I think they're actually using it because they're scared <laughs> or want to be scared. You know, it, the Ouija board today is most people's first on purpose experience with the paranormal. It's the first time they sat down and said, is anyone there? You know, they might have seen something or heard something before, but this is them doing it. And that really marks them. You know, when something bad or scary happens and, and you're doing that, you know, you, you know, your first experience, first time you kiss someone, had sex, drove a car, whatever, you remember it. And a lot of people play the Ouija board as a, a young person, a sleepover or something. It scares them. The lights go out, whatever. That board goes right on a shelf in the closet. Boop. You know, done with that. <laughs> and, and, and that's what happens. And then eventually someone finds that board and writes to John and I to take it off their hands. So right. um, we get a lot. John can talk about that. I mean, it's one of the coolest things about the museum. I say everything's cool in the museum. But one of the cooler things that John did was how he displays the boards that have been sent to us that they wanted out of the house. And the belief that getting the board out of the house is powerful. It's all belief, right? It's just all belief. And, and that's what's really interesting. When, when you said that, you know, I look at it as like something to play with. And, and it's not that I view it irreverently at all. It's that I don't think it has any power. I think we have the power. Ouija board is just cardboard and plastic. It's that we inside of us, when we sit at that board, something opens up, you know, whether that portal or door is to your subconscious whether it's some form of telepathy, whether there's actually parting the veil and talking to them, that's you. Well, I don't, I don't think you, I don't think you, when you're 17, 18, 19, 20, when you're kind of young, I don't think you approach it with that kind of analytical brain or the years of experience that you've had. I think you, you, you know, understand right. why the board is responsible and it's not me. Well, it's, it's the beauty of that is, and you wondered why tarot cards or other spirit communication devices really aren't as popular as Ouija. It's because we give our power to Ouija, unlike anything we do to other stuff. We say, Ouija, tell me this. What's the answer, Ouija? And, and when something goes wrong, we say, get the Ouija board out of the house, burn the board, put holy water on it and, and bury it. Once you've given power to something, that's where it's dangerous. And that's why younger people tend to get in trouble because they hand their power over to it. It's the thing. It has the power. They forget that it's always them. You know, it's yeah. what's going inside of them. You know, we say this all the time, like we're on the phone. Say John and I are on the phone. We get into some horrible fight. We call each other names. You know, I'm not taking my $1,200 iPhone and throwing it out the window and saying, I'll never have another one of these in my house because of I this have. fight. You know, <laughs> <laughs> Must have been some fight. <laughs> Get out of here. You know what you know yeah. what I'm saying? Is we yeah. blame the board. And once you do that, that's where the drama happens. Once you believe the board has power, you've handed it part of yourself. You've handed it something. And instead of saying, no, 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 this is just a, this is just the telephone I'm using. The telephone is just the telephone. There's a hang up button there. Goodbye. We're done. But if you don't believe that, you're going to get in trouble. Got gotcha. you. John, as a slight aside here, uh, and for you as well, Merch, do, do you ever get concerned parents? Do people ever track you down to help? My son's really worried that this has happened. You must do. Well, I get, I mean, people come to the museum with their kids because the parents have probably had a bad experience or heard a story. And so they come in here and they're like, these things are dangerous, right? And they want me to tell their kids about how dangerous the Ouija board is. And what's great is I don't I tell them, you know, <laughs> I show them history. I show them how it was viewed and how, you know, kids used it and couples, women used it alone. And all these things they think they knew about the Ouija board are probably wrong, you know. And so and then I've done the opposite as well. You know, people that come in uh, that aren't very afraid of the Ouija board. I'd be like, I didn't show you everything. And I'll talk about murders or suicides around the board. And I, you know, I want to show people what they might not expect about the board. If you go in and you think that it's an evil thing, I mean, sure, I want to reassure that <laughs> of that, but I'd rather show you some things that blow your mind and really give you something to think about. Well, that's and, blown my mind. Are there, are there murder and suicide stories around boards? Sure. I mean, 
the first suicide is by 1900. It's a woman in Connecticut who is so consumed with the messages that she got from the board. She wanted to find out for herself where the messages were coming from. She took strychnine. She poisoned herself to get to the other side of the board. 1886, which is four years before the Ouija board existed, the very first depiction in the newspaper we see of one of these boards, the headline to the newspaper called it a devil board. So there are bad things that happened from the very beginning. Has anyone ever released one called the devil board as a mass marketed? I have not seen that, but I've I'm on seen it. now there's a there is a Jesus board that just came out now called the really? Holy Spirit board, <laughs> a direct line to speak to Jesus. It actually says goodbye, Jesus on the bottom of the board. Wow. Yeah. I'd like to see the sales figure for that. Uh, I think they got in a little trouble. I, I'm sure I'm they pissed. did. Uh, the commercial, the, the YouTube video commercial for it is pretty hysterical, but um, I'm sure they caught a lot of backlash for it. It took me way longer than it should have to figure out who was behind that board. They are very well hidden. You can find it on Amazon. So if you put in a Holy Spirit board, you can buy it on Amazon. But finding out who the Holy Spirit company <laughs> is was not easy and uh on purpose i'm sure but it's it's hilarious it's great and there are lots of boards that are they have angel boards that are just marketed to people who are scared of ouija boards that supposedly this board will only talk to your guardian angel or other angels oh, yeah and i heard that um crowley was had come up with a, a new use for it and they decided between him and his friend that you could actually given the correct magical circle and protection just say this is a board for angels only mm -hmm. um, which is quite interesting but not surprising knowing all the things that uncle alistair got up to <laughs> yeah, i think for the for the the bad stuff you're talking the first murder associated with the ouija board 1933 and you know these stories that start to do start to pop up make it to like the pulp magazines the detective magazines and that of course is basically before it eventually makes it into Hollywood and, you know, makes it into more of a staple in horror movies. But what's even funny about that is the very first talking uh, horror movie, 1928, called The Terror. It has a Ouija board in it. So, you know, the Ouija board is closely associated with horror movies as well as a dark side to it. I'll tell you what, actually, what started me off on this and tracking you down originally was a story that appeared uh, maybe a couple of weeks ago about the whole classroom of schoolgirls that collapsed <laughs> because they'd been using the board in class? Was that in Mexico or Brazil? Uh, Colombia. Colombia. Well, the story I read suggested they were using it in class, which made it even funnier. But there, was, there were no details other than the, the sketchy top level. But then I looked further, and that's, that's, a, that's a common thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Happened a few times, especially in, in, you know, Central and South America, you see quite a bit of the, the superstitions coming out and a lot of the like the mass hysteria, you know, like we don't see that as much in the United States, but we've tracked a few of these. When John was doing his presentation at the Satanic Temple, I have no idea what year that was, but what that year that he did it, we we actually had we found video from the. Um, you know, the news down there about a similar incident. And when you watch it, it's terrifying. I mean, if, if the Ouija board caused that, holy hell, you know what I mean? But then when you dig deeper to these stories, you find out they were doing drugs or someone had given them some tea that had something in it. And it, you know, again, it, it's blame the Ouija board, not blame the people or take any responsibility for it. So when you dig in, you find out these stories are not as clear cut. From what I know, there's always been a lot of pushback from the churches. I think over here in, in the UK, our church has, has about as much power and bravado now as a McDonald's Happy Meal. It's, it's, kind of, it's kind of just there. No one really pays attention to anything they say. But in, in America, um, still a big thing. I've seen, you know, the, we, I grew up with with the Christians being against um, Kiss and Alice Cooper, that's my big heritage, and generally being against anything in a very literal, uh, there was a very short fuse and it, it didn't take much of a flame to light it for them. Is there still that pushback now? I mean, I think after The Exorcist, certainly 
here in America, the satanic panic kind of really started to take hold. And I think at that point, yes, the Ouija board really got more of a negative, you know, connection to it from more of a religious side. But prior to that, I mean, I'm besides maybe some local smaller churches and stuff, uh, we don't really see any press release or any kind of, you know, official statement from like, say, the Vatican or anything like that. It's small regional areas where something's happened. And so uh, a priest makes a statement or something like that. But I think most of the backlash from that side tends to be uh, more from the satanic panic of the 80s and the 90s. Today, I don't think so much. Oh, Satan, you've lost your power. <laughs> oh, you know what? I, I think it's the opposite. I think really? Satan is more popular. It's He's way more popular today than he used to be. I, I, people's tolerance is, is, I mean, you see these movies and these stories, that's not changing things. It's not making it worse. It's not making it harder to find Ouija boards. It's, it's actually, it's boosting the sales. I mean, when I worked on the two Ouija movies, you know, Ouija in uh, 20, uh, 2014 and then Ouija Origin of Evil in 2016, and there were significant bounce of sales on movies that were supposed to scare you. I mean, that's what happens. I mean, America is a different, we're a different animal. You know, yeah. we, we, are, we, we, we like to be scared and then we like to tell everyone what to do and what not to do. But we do, every, we do what we want behind the scenes. We just say that. So like for us, as cr the Christian right in America, yeah, they don't like anything right now. They don't like trans people. They're, they don't want to talk about gays. They don't want to talk about anything that's happening in the world they don't like. But in their own house and stuff, that's not how people live. I mean, it's very hypocritical. This has got nothing to do with Ouija at all, but I've been to Colorado uh, three times or always oh. to the same place, Keystone. Yes. And your airport's pretty weird. <laughs> <laughs> it, isn't it? Did, did, do I remember rightly? That, is it, it? It's got some kind of weird UFO connection, right? Oh, yeah. So, <laughs> I mean, there's there's like what people think and then and, and they've embraced this so if right now there's a lot of construction going around they're adding another terminal it's a gigantic airport when it was built it closed down two or three other airports that were like in the city you know kind of around it and this one is kind of outside of the city and they just wanted to you know keep everything together i guess but there are many levels down and because we're near norad and there's a lot of nsa listening posts out here because of how well it connects to satellites and stuff it's believed that the reason there is there's probably trains that run underneath there for important people it's probably part of keeping people safe in the government should things happen right. but because there's so much secrecy when they were building it i mean they literally put up tarps so people couldn't see what they were digging you know everyone's imagination runs wild and, and there are a lot of ufo sightings out here because there is a lot of Air Force bases and stuff as well. So now if you're walking around, you will see a huge alien coming out of the wall and yeah. there'll be a sign that says, uh, if, <clears throat> if you've seen my friends, let tell them I'm on, you know, level 14. And then <laughs> it will be like the Illuminati or like, hey, we're trying to find our, our meeting. Could you let us know where to be? There's a gargoyle that will scream at you and stuff. I mean, what I love about out here is they embrace the craziness. And so now it's actually part of the airport. And, and, I, and I'm working with them because we did a small exhibit of women in history and we got Helen and some Ouija boards, but um, we have done an exhibit in San Francisco airport that was like 275 Ouija boards, tons of pictures, all kinds of stuff. It was, it was just gigantic. It was awesome. And I would love to see that in Denver because it's the airport is so weird. It's the perfect place for this. I love America. <laughs> 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 Only in America. Well, don't forget mm -hmm. Lucifer as well out front. Yeah, oh, that's right. They, you know, we so they're the um, the Broncos are the big uh, football team, and by football, mm -hmm. American football. And it, they, what they did was they wanted a Bronco, and the colors are orange, burnt orange, and blue. And so this artist created this gigantic blue stallion. And while he was working on it, it fell over and killed him. And so it was close to the end. And so people were like, oh, like this is that's not a great part of the story. And, but the city had paid for. I mean, you know, it's just all paid for and done. And they didn't know where to do with it. And people didn't really want it at the at that moment when it happened. People were like, uh, that's bad luck. So in the end, they actually put it outside of the airport. And when you're driving, 
you can see it and it, it lights up from the inside. So his eyes are kind of like orange and they glow. So he looks <laughs> scary. And that's why, so we would like to put, I mean, they're going to have, and they call him Belucifer because he's blue and, you know, the thing killed, okay. the, or killed the guy who made him. So yeah, it's Wonderful. crazy. I mean, you must get even worse in Salem. I mean, the amount of people that, uh, you, you must have a regular parade of freaks. I don't even bat it. It, it, it. What's funny is if you see people walking around in costume in, you know, the middle of the summer, it, most people don't even bat an eye. It just doesn't, you have to do something pretty shocking to, to really catch people here, I think, which is awesome. You know, I think it's pretty cool that uh, lo people love to visit Salem because it's so diverse, because it's so welcoming, it's so friendly. And, you know, it's a, it's a spooky city, an old historic city on the East Coast, right on the water. And so, you know, it just lends itself to be a place that people want to go to. But really, honestly, there's very few things that I see that I'm like, wow, holy crap. And, uh, you know, when you talk about any kind of like religious backlash or, or anything like that, only in October that once in a while there's um, a preacher that comes, gets up on a on a soapbox literally and um but while he's there now that the satanic temple opened in salem about eight eight years or nine years ago uh they usually come and counter protest him so uh that's the only thing that i would say but pretty soon we'll be having our pride parade and it's amazing because you know you see people come through and the love for salem and the love of the people there and um it's uh, to me it's, it's a really special place and I don't think there's too many things that are shocking there. I must go. It's it's. I think it's worth going. Uh, everyone should go. I don't suggest if it's your first time, don't go in October. Go a little off season, maybe like the summer or very early fall. Is that just a Halloween thing? Yeah, well, it's busy all the time, but specifically October is crazy. There's usually well over 100,000 people in costume, almost wow. like Mardi Gras in, in New Orleans. It's a lot of people there on the weekends. And so because of that, people then, oh, I'm going to go a little earlier. I'm going to go down. I'm going to go during the week. And so that pushes everything back to really more like August. It starts really filling up. And if you've never been before, you know, and you want to go to a museum, you want to go to a restaurant, you don't have to wait to go to the bathroom. You will wait, you know, 45 minutes plus just to go into a store where you don't know if you're going to buy anything. So wow. uh, going mm -hmm. off season is, is a better idea because you get a, a lay of the land. You get to, you know, don't have to wait for anything. And then coming back in October is a different experience where now you get to see, you know, it's more of an outdoor thing. You're what you're people watching most of that, you know. I had a look online for different boards and you can now get them in pretty much any language. I've seen some Chinese ones, which don't look great because you can't work them. Um, I couldn't see a Russian one anywhere. Oh, we just got it. Hold on, hold on. Oh, wait. Right, this is what I love, John. We'll have it handy. <laughs> I have one here. Now, I thought they may have been not so popular because the Russians might have pushed back. But there this it is. is. This is brand new. It only came out maybe the last like six to eight months, maybe. And um, mm -hmm. to me, I, it's the only mass produced Russian board that I've ever come across. Merch might know of, other, of, of others, but uh, it, it is pretty unique, whether it's the one and only or probably less than few, less than a, a few known of them. But yeah, so Russia, Russia does have it as well. Truly global. I also read, what am I, I've made a note here. Uh, one of the first mentions of the automatic writing method used in the Ouija board was found in China in 1100 AD. That's like a thousand years ago. <laughs> I'm guessing there's not much more information going back that far. That I mean, that that's a whole other ball game, right? Yeah, those. What it's talking about is more of a planchette and more of a pendulum type thing. They did use something where they would take a basket and, and stick like a, a a rod inside of it, and then kind of try to move it around in the sand. It's not what you think of as a talking board, and so. It, though people will say it was uh, even in Witchboard, the movie, it was in, invented at the time of Pythagoras. It's none of that's true. The, right. They did have oracles. They did consult them. They were not talking boards. And and even a pendulum that works 
that can work with ear motor response, we don't count that the same. It has to be a surface that has letters, numbers, words, and a movable piece that points those letters out. That's a talking board. And so these things that they kind of looking at, yeah, the planchette predated the Ouija board. So the movable pointer on the board used to be around 1850, 1853, uh, someone figured out that if they made this device that had two wheels on the back and you could put a pencil through the tip where the third wheel would go, you could place your hand on that, ask the spirits, and it would write the answers. The problem being, it takes forever. And I don't know, have you ever seen your handwriting? My handwriting is horrible. On, on that note, I, I saw that the very famous Seth books by, mm. by Jane Roberts were written with the board. Yes. Um, but that yep. must have taken forever. She's not the only one. She's more of a modern person. Uh, you go back to the you know teens and 20s and you're talking about Pearl Curran and Patience Worth. And uh, she won, you know, she won major awards for her books. This is an illiterate person, like barely knows how to read and write. And she's writing stuff as the spirit told her letter by letter. Yeah. Can you imagine how long it would take to write a book? just with being pointed at. And, and that happens with the planchette. It's like, oh, wait. So the planchette turns into the pointer for the Ouija board. So it merges and, and becomes something different. You can still get writing planchettes today. You know, some people are really into it. But again, no one says, oh, my God, this planchette gave me a nasty message. Get it out of my house. That doesn't happen. The Ouija yeah. board tells you you're going to die and all hell breaks loose. Yeah, my personal experience is I've never I've never had a you're going to die, but I've had some especially using using a, a glass tumbler on a wooden surface. The speed that thing got up some days was mm -hmm. I mean it wasn't spelling out anything by that point, you just round and round and round. I had a really frightening like wow, no no one is pushing this. Long time dead. Go watch that movie. That is a great UK movie that revolves around the use of a, a glass like a piece of glass and letters putting around it and a, and a like a little tumbler or a shot glass it's a great scary movie the end's not so great i gotta be honest with you but the whole thing right up until the end it's a it's done very well I, it was one up until that i don't remember what year it came out in but it is one of the better ouija movies for sure okay i tell you, i watched the trailer for um uh, origin just before we booted this up that looks good i've not seen that it is it's a good movie in it and and any good parts you like are because of me no because of kidding. you <laughs> yeah, no not at all i'm, I'm totally being I just like I, anytime you put you, a horror movie that has kids in it it's always creepier so mm -hmm. that board is in is in uh john's museum and the planchette too the eye to the other side superb have i missed anything Thing that you'd like known i guess you get asked the same questions all day in day out right well john why don't you tell them how the hours that are open for the museum because the point is we want to get people to come to the museum he's he's in salem i mean if you go to visit you're visiting the witch city the ouija boards used to be made there up until you know from 1966 to 1991 it is a former ouija home and Going into his museum is just, and and I'm telling you, man, I, you know, I, like John said, I have thousands of these. I'm surrounded by this crap. It's an epic. Even if you have a, just a story, you're going to walk into this museum and be like, I have come to the right place. <laughs> so I, I urge your listeners out there, take a trip to Salem. Just Salem is amazing. The icing on the cake is the Salem Witchboard Museum. Hit me with your yeah. details. Uh, 127 Essex Street, right in the heart of Salem. Uh, the main street you want to do something on is Essex Street um, in the back of the Harry Potter store. So it's like a speakeasy. Like, like I said, you got to go through the back. Do you of have the a flat. little a little iron grill? No, that, no, oh, that's I shame. don't. But what's funny is uh, people that come to the Harry Potter store, a lot of kids, they're able to look behind the, um, the cashier. There's an archway that leads into the museum. On that very back wall is roughly about 50 different Ouija boards from World War II. And um, when people see that, they're like, wait, is that is that Ouija boards back there? And they grab the kids, they run out of the shop. So I get to see firsthand how much fear people put into the Ouija board, how much power, because a lot of people not knowing it's there, when they see Ouija boards, they take off. 
Actually, that, that prompts a good question. During World War II, was there a, I mean, there's so many people dying all the time. W was there a surge in, oh, what should we call it, board activity around then? Well, it's a huge surge in sales, for sure. I mean, uh, I'd say I would probably argue that the 1940s is probably one of the most popular times for talking boards. I mean, in the museum, like I said, there's at least 50 on display, 50 different ones. And I'd say there's probably closer to another 50 that aren't there. So World War II in America, it's very popular. Um, one of the ads that, that I have hanging in the museum is uh, it's a real Ouija ad from the time. And it says, will Hitler surrender 43 or 44? Ask the Ouija board. <laughs> so they're advertising the Ouija to go ask when the war might end. One of the boards uh, from that same time frame, it has all this text around the border of it. And it has options for your career, your love life, and when the war will end. One of the options on that board is Germany will surrender when Hitler dies by his own hand. It's on the board made before the war ended. But then on the flip side of that, you know, there's photographs that we have uh, of a soldier stationed overseas during World War II using a Ouija board. And he's asking the board how his wife and kids are back home. Mm -hmm. so I really like to show that balance of it's not just, you know, people who have lost someone. It's other questions. You know, the Great Depression, you're asking financial questions, you're asking job opportunities, you're asking relationship questions. And of course, during the war, when will this when will this war end? And so, um, but yeah, World War II, I would say, arguably in the United States, was probably the most popular time for it. That's amazing. Just by the amount of people making them. Are there any other periods that produce specific boards for with those uh, kinds of questions on on board? Not with the questions, but I would say with the seventies, there's definitely uh, catering it more to uh, by the later seventies when the Vietnam War ends. I think they're catering it back to uh, a dating game as well. So sort of like how they do in 1920 when there's love songs about the Ouija board. By the mid to late 70s, you know, kind of after the Vietnam War ends, the you get the psychic sex board where it's a board where you consult spirits if you'll have the lights on tonight or not. Uh, the Ziera <laughs> board, which has almost the full alpha, uh, the, almost a dictionary thrown out on it. And that has, um, it's called the adult party game. So they're really marketing it to these couples using the board together. And then also the, the Mantic Message Mat from the 70s as well. And that is um, was sold on the Love Boat the cruise ship in the 1970s. Uh, they sold a talking board on it. And so they're, they're definitely using it more of the dating game aspect to it. Wow. Yeah. Just, and, wow. And, and to follow up with John, when he's talking about the war, you know, I, I, I'd like to collect it everything Ouija so anything letters whatever and so some really cool letters have popped up that family members were writing to the, their soldiers that were in there and then soldiers writing back and one of them is this, this letter that's really sad it's this this mother who's writing to her son and she said you know I'm really nervous uh, I haven't heard from you in a few weeks and but I talked to Ouija last night and it said you were fine but please write us when you can and, you know, tell us that you're okay and, and, you know, show us that we just telling the truth. Okay. The day she wrote that he was killed because we can see, I can look him up. Okay. She was writing to this guy. His private was this, he, he was sucked into, um, he was on the, in the Navy and he was on a battleship. And when one of the planes was taking off, he got sucked into the engine and died. It was like a terrible death. And it's the same day that she wrote that letter. So the response, what she got back was your son has, you know, been killed, which is really awful. But that's what these, you got to remember, people consult Ouija boards because they answer things nothing else can. Mm. It doesn't true. It's just something's better than nothing. Humans don't like puzzles. We don't like not to know. And when we don't know, we create belief as a bridge <laughs> until we can understand it better. And it's, it's just a fascinating thing. These letters are snapshots sometimes. There's people diaries. Oh, we played the Ouija board, you know, 1910, some little girls talking about running home and playing the Ouija board. And you know, I have a, a great little book of a woman going into the service in the forties and her and a bunch of the women who are in her troop, they sneak out to use the Ouija board like every Thursday. And she writes down what it says, you know, 
it, it's just part of our culture. You know, we're yeah. no closer to understanding what happens when you die. And the Ouija board, it gives us a chance to explore that, you know, I, try before you buy, or as John says, try before you die. So either way. <laughs> I guess we're all still wondering what, um, it, it's the eternal question, isn't it? What happens later? And, 100%. Uh, and the board is just a, just a fantastic little piece of history. Uh, it really is. Yeah. I haven't used one for decades, well, not decades, a lot of years, well, at least two decades. But just kind of looking at this now, talking to you guys, I'm going, hmm, maybe it's well, time. You, you totally should. You know, one of the cooler things is that in 1890, very quickly, the business explodes. And, you know, they go from having one little factory in Baltimore to having two factories in Baltimore, two factories in New York, two factories in Chicago, and a factory in London. And Elijah Bond, he leaves and to go take care of the business in London, and he destroys it. I, he's just a bad business person. Everything he touches kind of business-wise ends up going down. And what's really cool is years before we knew about Helen, right? This guy contacted me and said, I just put this board, um, this Ouija board I found in that my, my grandmother used to have and use on eBay, but I was just wondering if you know anything about it. And as soon as I saw it, I realized, oh my God, this is the oldest Ouija board I've ever seen come out of the UK. And, it, and the planchette was a dead ringer. It was definitely an Elijah Bond planchette, but the board was so professional done. It looked so much better than the board that was being sold um, in the United States. It also didn't have Ouija on the top. And so it was just a mystery. And it, and it came with a little book where his grandmother would write in there, you know, talking to so-and-so. So then, you know, Helen pops up. We, we realized there was a woman involved. Well, Helen in 1891, her husband is the son of a very famous uh, psychic and medium in England, lived in Manchester. Mm -hmm. And so she goes back to London. They live in London for a while. She was part of the business. And when I, when I finally found that out, then I'm interviewing her grandson. Her grandson goes, I said, geez, I would love to find her Ouija board, like the board that they were using when it named itself. Like, holy crap. That's like the holy grail. Ouija that's the board. holy grail, yeah. Right. It's like, oh my God. And, and of course, we'll never know. But what's funny is, so maybe I picked this board up three or four years before we know anything about a woman. And then I find out there's a woman. She lives in London for quite a few years. Her grandson says to me, oh, you'll probably never find it because um, I was told she gave the board um, to a family member in London. So then wait a minute. Ding, ding, ding. Okay, wait a minute. I never asked the person I bought that board from what their grandmother's maiden name was. Like, I didn't, I just didn't think, you know what I mean? I should have. It was actually a really stupid researcher move. It was a, uh, you know, a brain dead moment. And uh, so it took me about three months to track this gentleman down. He had moved from Manchester after he sold all his family stuff and still was in the UK. And I tracked him down and he said, he tells me his grandmother. And I'm like, mm, that's not, I don't, I'm not getting anything from that. What was your great grandmother's maiden name? And he says, oh, Nosworthy. And I'm like slapping my head. Well, Helen Peters married Ernest Nosworthy. The woman whose board this came from was Helen's sister-in-law, Ernest's sister, that they lived with when they were over there. So that is very likely was Helen's board because she wouldn't have gotten it any other way, but that may be the board they were using. It's the, the earliest thing we can tie. So it, it's like things like that happen all the time where you just got to keep everything because you never know what clue or piece becomes important. That's very cool. Yeah, super cool. And, and it, that, that I'll tell everyone who's listening, that board, if you want to see uh, Helen Peters' board, the earliest one that we know of, it is sitting in uh, the Salem Witch Board Museum, waiting for you to come ask it a question. <laughs> do, do you ever use any of the, of the boards on display? Do people I, get I mean, involved I, at all? Is it just a, you can just look? Oh, no, there's boards out for people to use, and that's very common as well. Uh, people come into the museum, don't really care so much about the history. They want the experience of using the board. So it's pretty common, especially when it's like slower season, like this time of year. And um, not too long ago, there was a family, a mother, three kids. The oldest kid was probably about 10 years old. 
and they were laying on the floor using the Ouija board. I, you know, I gave them privacy and they weren't interrupting anybody else. Uh, they used it for about 20 minutes. They stopped, they put it away, walked to the door. They all turned around at the same time that ran back out. They pulled the Ouija board out and used it for another 20 minutes. So yeah, it's pretty common. I would, I would argue that the Ouija board at the museum, that uh, one of the ones that stays out all the time, is probably one of the more well-used boards out there. <laughs> Interesting. Listen, you've been very kind with your time. That's been wonderful. And I'll, um, on my travels, I'll try and look one or the other one of you up. Please do. Um, Please do. That's been fantastic. Absolutely. You, you're always welcome to come visit me here in Denver, and you can visit Helen's gravestone. She's buried here. Bizarrely, she left London, went to Denver, and spent the rest of her life here. So... You can come visit her grave, but you cannot miss Salem and the Salem Witch Board Museum. I'm telling you, your your mind will be blown. I kind of like the idea of Salem. Who doesn't like the idea of Salem? It does live up to the hype. It's really cool. It was a pretty bloody history, though. Yeah. Said the guy yeah. from the UK. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, you burned the witches. You guys yeah, burned them. We only you hung, just hung them. and crushed them, you know? Them. Yeah. Yeah, you can't beat a good old Vincent Price movie, right? <laughs> <laughs> thank you fellas thank you. I'll speak Appreciate to you again soon thank right, you so much thank you very much take care bye bye, -bye. bye.